Can copepods wipe out the uglies in our tank? Maybe a better question about timing. Can a jar of pods before the lights come on solve the problem before it even starts? You've never seen anything as definitive as this. This is BRTV Investigates the Biome Cycle, and I will never look at pods the same way again. It's week 25 of our biome experiment. We just finished phase two, where we intentionally infected all 12 experiment tanks with dinos, diatom, cyano, green algae, and chrysophytes to see which could fend them off for 10 weeks. Some did well, others did not. This is phase three, the missing link, microcrustaceans and copepods. Is there a reason that some of these photosynthetically ugly pests are exploding in our tanks completely unchecked? Because there's no natural predator in the tank. Time to find out. It's pretty rare that we see any answer as definitive as this. To find out, we dose algae barns, ecopods, each of these 12 tanks. This is four species of copepods. However, we're looking for something more definitive here, not a starter culture, but what would an established population do? For that reason, we're dosing 16 jars to each tank. I don't want to wait four weeks and wonder if the pods really did it. I want to see a major, definable, and replicable change in days. There's another piece to this, an ounce of prevention up front meaning a single jar or a source like dark rubble is likely all that's needed to establish a population before the lights come on. But after the problems explode, we need a pound of cure. These 16 jars are the pound of cure to some pretty major problems in these tanks. Starting with the control, this tank picked up a bad case of diatoms in week 19, which progressed, got worse, and despite an attempt at cleaning, only came back worse. A month and a half later, week 25, the tank is in a terrible spot. This is the point at which we dose the ecopods, will they solve it? Week 26, we're looking for something definitive after dosing the pods and we got it. All the diatoms turn into a processed sludge. This greatly exceeded my expectations. Week 27, we manually clean the tank as much of the sludge as possible. Now in week 28, unlike before, the explosive orange diatoms do not come back, but we do see signs of cyano and some green film algae. Week 29, the orange diatoms are gone, but I believe the cyano and green film algae are likely fueled by the nutrients. A newly reset battlefield with one of the large ugly armies wiped out near instantly. Next, what about a tank that already had pods and never had a problem with the orange diatoms? The dark cured rubble tank, week 25. This is one of the tanks that was able to defend or independently solve the introduction of all five uglies. I guess I wouldn't assume much is going to happen here with the addition of pods. I was wrong. Green film algae rapidly shows up and coats the entire back of the tank in sand. I believe this is likely due to a rapid increase in nutrients from the newly introduced wave of copepods processing all the waste in the tank. Week 28, it stays largely clean. Same in week 29. However, if you look at week 25 versus week 29, I think it actually looks a bit worse post copepods. Again, likely that wave of pods resetting some of that battlefield and the released nutrients from rapidly processed detritus and other prey. Next, the Aquaforest Life Source tank. This tank actually looks great in week 15, but after we dosed the pest slurry, it lacked the defenses or predators to fend off the diatoms. We left week 25 with an orange diatom explosion, which left the life source media sticking to it. This is where we dosed the ecopods, what's under that mud. One week later, week 26, a dramatic change. Diatoms are receding, but rapidly replaced with cyano. So you tend to point out that reefers commonly notice a shift to cyano like this with any unstable tank where a hammer solution to an ugly pest was used like algicides, bacteria, heavy carbon dosing, or stripping nutrients. Eliminating the biggest army from the battlefield resets it, and the most aggressive photosynthetically ugly will often take its place. If I had to do this over again, I would turn the lights off and truly reset the tank. In week 27, we clean the tank, but some of the cyano is difficult to remove. However, in week 28, the tank naturally starts to beat the cyano on its own. My belief is a microbiome or bacteria from the life source is what's battling the cyano. But in week 29, we start to see some of the dinos. The total of 16 jars of pods may be turning out to be more effective than I would have liked and wiping out all of the diatoms at once, causing a reset event in the tank. So it would likely have gone better with a four week dark period after the pods to let the tank reset without competing for the territory with the photosynthetics. Next, Ocean Direct, which had a similar biome profile as the Aquaforest Life Source Reef Mud and both a natural ocean substrate. This one looked pristine in week 15, but post pest slurry introduction ended week 25 with a bad case of diatoms and cyano mixed throughout the tank. We dosed the ecopods. Will it solve one or both? Week 26, the diatoms largely turn into sludge, but the cyano is taking advantage of that. Week 27, we clean the tank. Week 29, some of the cyano returns, but not like it was, and the tank is resetting with some green film algae and cyano. 
Now, both the Ocean Direct tank and the Aquaforce Life Source tank had the solid eDNA biome balance scores and looked great after 10 weeks of lighting, but both couldn't beat the diatoms. It's hard to not wonder what would happen if we had introduced those ecopods up front. I think it's fair to believe that there'd be no orange diatom explosion or huge reset in this tank. This gets at the concept of biome redundancy, where no one thing is the end all solution for all things and multiple solutions that back each other up is the best or highest percentage path to success. Next, the established marine pure bio brick. Other than a green tint to the rock and some catomorpha, this tank is successfully defended against the five major pests we dosed to the tank. This is where we dose the pods, pay attention to the state of that clean back of the tank and the catamorpha macroalgae. It's about to change. Week 26, the green algae take off. The algae in the back emerges fast. The cato is five times what it was last week and the green film algae in the rock much darker. Again, what I believe to be related to the copepods rapidly processing detritus, prey and waste into nutrients for the algae. Week 27, we clean the tank and other than the green film algae tint on the rock, it stays clean to week 29. Notice that the green tint does not grow back on the block, however. Weeks 25 and 30, before and after the pods, almost identical, and the pods are likely unnecessary, but the intentional addition of a large wave of pods does indicate a cleaning effect. Next, 100% of the 160s water, we left this tank off in week 25, covered in diatoms and cyano, but this is a different type of sheeting cyano, which is very difficult to manually remove. We dose the ecopods, but it won't solve both. Week 26, the diatoms darken, the tank sludge forms, the cyano explodes. Week 27, we clean the tank, but can't get the cyano off the rock. Weeks 28 and 29, largely the same. Leaving the diatoms in the past, but cyano unaffected, maybe even empowered. Next, the Indonesian wet live rock. We left this tank off in week 25, covered in diatoms, algae and cyano. We dosed the pods. It's hard to imagine this tank turning around with something as simple as copepods, but in many ways it does. Week 26 is now that familiar pod process sludge, but maybe the best instance of that. Week 27, we clean the tank, but a lot of the hard to remove algae remains. Week 28, the sand does have a clear purple coating of cyano, but otherwise looks the same as the cleaning week. Week 29, algae still there, but a vast majority of the rest is gone. I think the biggest takeaway here is the Indo Live Rock that came wrapped in moist newspaper was likely not a source of copepods, despite the common belief otherwise. At least not the type that prey on these orange diatoms. Next up, a contrast to that with wet live rock cultured in the Gulf, stored in water, shipped submerged in water to your tank. Week 25, we left off in a fairly good spot. Only real problem is hair algae and a bit of cyano. We dosed the equipods. Note the state of the sand and the hair algae in the rocks themselves. It changes. Week 26, the omega addition of pods causes the sand to clear and the algae in the rocks start to dissipate. Maybe more notable, you don't see anything explode from the addition of pods. I believe it's because this is the livest possible source of rock, which also tested by aquabiomics as the most diverse microbiome. There's just a lot of microorganisms processing the detritus and waste in this tank, so the pods didn't cause a major bloom. Week 27, we clean the tank. Only thing that remains is cyano. Sadly, that cyano was in there in week 25 and week 28. It takes advantage of even this limited reset and ends week 29 with a healthy amount of cyano. But note, the algae is not coming back nearly as fast. While I think it's clear the ecopods are predators of diatoms and some algaes, they don't seem to prey or reduce cyano. However, it's also clear that when any one thing explodes in the tank, in this case, copepods, there's a chain of events that follows. Some good, some less so. I believe throughout this experiment, it's clearly demonstrating that all live rocks are not created equal, and this golf rock clearly added copepods to defend against the diatoms from the beginning and didn't need them to be intentionally introduced like this. Next up, the coral biome tank. This one demonstrates a clear effect on the food chain and what happens when that changes. Week 25, we left off with diatom, cyano, explosive cases of planaria flatworms. There's one thing I want you to all see. See that red bottom on the rocks? That's all flatworms. But notice that it's not spread to the sand, their preferred habitat. It's always been the rock. It doesn't stay that way. We dose the pods. Week 26, there's a familiar sludge that immediately develops on the rock and the sand. Week 27, we clean the tank, but look how the flatworms have migrated to the sand. Week 28, the green film algae shows up, which expands into week 29, but now there's planaria exploding on virtually every surface. It's very likely because the pods are a major food source for the flatworms and resulted in explosive growth. Next, the 360 rock and sand. This tank should perform nearly identical to the dark rubble because they both came from the same tank and have the same microbiome and pods introduced. Is this true? 
We 25, we left with some algae and small patches of cyano and signs of matted bubble forms of chrysophyte. We dosed the ecopods. Week 26, very similar result, a significant increase in green film algae on the glass, sand, and rocks. Neither had a problem with orange diatoms ever. Week 27, we clean the tank, and the small spot of cyano rapidly comes back. Week 28, spreads a bit more, but the tank largely looks the same. Week 29, post ecopods looks largely the same as week 25 pre ecopods. And to be frank, not a big surprise for one big reason. Both the dark rubble and this tank have rock that came from my 360, and at one point, I dosed ecopods to this tank, meaning these two experiment tanks very likely started with ecopods already in there. They stabilized around a food source, and even a mega dose of more only had a small effect. Next up, real reef. This one bridges the gap between dry rock and live rock by being cured in seawater. Again, looked great post 10 weeks of lighting in week 15, but could not defend against the pest slurry or orange diatoms. In week 25, we left it pretty ugly. We introduced the pods, diatoms dissipate, sludge and cyano follows. But something new happens in just a moment. In week 27, we clean the tank, cyano comes back rapidly, but in week 28, the cyano goes away on its own and is replaced by golden brown slime, which in week 29 is now clearly matted bubble chrysophytes. What all these examples keep telling us is when one organism loses, another will win. And if we want to win and not have to experience all this, the best path is likely to assume all five uglies will be in the tank and do what's required to beat them before they're a problem rather than after. An ounce of prevention rather than a pound of cure. In this case, a single jar of pods up front rather than 16 today. Next, the tank that started it all, the original source of the dreaded orange diatoms, sand from Steve's tank. This tank is in a unique position of being likely both the donor of the problem and the solution. Watching this tank, you can see it's the only experiment tank that had these diatoms, but then solved them on their own as well. However, it's not surprising that the slower to replicate predator copepods likely trailed the much faster replicating photosynthetic diatoms, and why it took a while for them to catch up once the lights were turned on. Week 25, the tail end of fighting the diatoms, hair algae or filamentous form of chrysophytes and cyano, likely a result of a natural reset of that battlefield once the diatoms were gone. At this point, we dosed the ecopods. Week 26, sludge, cyano, and slime forms in the sand. Week 27, we clean the tank. Things look reasonably good with nothing rapidly emerging. However, week 28, the cyano comes, and week 29, the cyano gets worse. The cyano is always in the tank, but now it has the right conditions or lack of competition, which allows it to take over. Looking at 12 of these, there's one thing that's abundantly clear to me. Pods can prevent and solve orange diatoms and likely some other pests in our tank. Another, our hobby needs to evolve past that addiction to treating, poisoning, starving off pest organisms after the fact and find a new era where we can use what we've learned from that to predict and prevent them in the first place. That's next. We take everything that we've learned from all of these experiments to develop the next wave of experiments in the pursuit of the perfect biome cycle.